financial support of viewers like you and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The arrest of Manuel Noriega focuses new attention on his long relationship with the United States and what the government knew about his drug connections. It became clearer and clearer that there was drug trafficking through Panama and that uh, Noriega was involved in it. Frontline investigates how the U.S. government, under four different presidents, used Noriega to further its political aims despite mounting evidence of his corruption. There are benefits to being able to have relations with a man who has these different contacts. His G2, his intelligence people, often had much better intelligence about the unfolding of events in Nicaragua than did U.S. intelligence sources. I think that we became more concerned about fighting communism in Central America than we were about standing up for what we knew to be right. Tonight, drugs, politics, and the Noriega connection. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston, this is Frontline with Judy Woodruff. Good evening. As the legal maneuvering for the trial of Manuel Antonio Noriega intensifies, it is becoming clear the former Panamanian dictator may try to put the United States itself on trial by using his long relationship with our government as a defense against the drug charges he faces. For the past nine months, Frontline has conducted its own investigation of Noriega's secret relationships with agencies of the U.S. government, relationships that stretch back nearly 30 years. Because of recent events, we are presenting that report tonight. Our investigation uncovered thousands of photographs from Noriega's personal collection, many of them seen here for the first time tonight. We interviewed Noriega's friends and enemies, intelligence agents in several countries, and we reviewed hundreds of confidential documents. That investigation reveals how four different U.S. administrations used Noriega to further their own political goals and ignored or covered up evidence of his corruption and brutality. The Nixon administration developed the first hard evidence of Noriega's drug connections, but decided not to indict him. President Ford's CIA director, George Bush, kept Noriega on the CIA payroll despite evidence he was spying on a U.S. military intelligence operation. During debate on President Carter's Panama Canal Treaty, the complete investigative file on Noriega disappeared from the DEA. And the Reagan administration continued to use Noriega's help in the Contra War, despite evidence the dictator was also helping the Medellin drug cartel. And now, as President Bush tries to write the final chapter of the Noriega story in court, the government may have to face publicly what Noriega knows and will tell about his long relationship with the United States. Tonight's report was produced by Charles Stewart and Marcia Vivancos. It is called The Noriega Connection. This photograph of Manuel Antonio Noriega Moreno was taken in December of 1944. He is 11 years old. To my Aunt Flora, he wrote on the back, as a reminder of my first communion from Tony. We uh, were neighbors, and my mother uh, told me that uh, he was a, a very uh, humble uh, guy. Uh, Luis Estribi grew and, uh, up with Noriega. Uh, within his family, there were, uh, you know, kind of irregularities, and they were not the... Uh, um, a normal family. According to those who grew up with him, Noriega was born in the remote province of Darien, near the Colombian border, in 1933, the illegitimate son of his father's maid. He was rejected by both father and mother and was sent to Panama City to live with an aunt.
Department of Defense Biographic Report. Confidential. Name, Manuel Antonio Noriega Moreno. Nickname, Tony. Civil Education, The National Institute, graduated with diploma. University of Panama, non-graduate. In high school, Noriega wrote that he wanted to be a psychiatrist, and then the president of Panama. His 1952 yearbook shows a less serious Noriega playfully strangling another student. I met Noriega when uh, he was a youngster. Very uh, peaceful and quiet. I dare say that the only exception to this uh, otherwise uh, very normal temper was when we came across with the police fighting in the streets. Then uh, it was one of the more brave, the one who threw more stones to the uniformed people. That time uh, we could swear that he will never be one of them. Noriega's half-brother, Luis Carlos, was in the foreign ministry at the time, and he passed information on to the CIA. Noriega, who had joined the Socialist Youth Movement, gathered information on its members for his brother to give to the Americans. At age 25, he applied for a scholarship to a military academy in Peru. He was too old to be admitted, so he lied about his age. By now, Noriega was dealing directly with American military intelligence, and he passed on information concerning his fellow students. Upon graduation, Noriega returned to Panama and joined the National Guard, where he continued to nurture his relationship with the U.S. His commanding officer was Omar Torrijos. Noriega has maintained a friendly and cooperative relationship with U.S. military personnel since prior to joining the National Guard in 1962. Guillermo Sanchez Bubon is a Panamanian newspaperman who covered Torrijos and Noriega. Yo no sé, seguramente que Torrijos le vio el talento natural que tenía este para eso. Torrijos probably spotted Noriega's talents because rumors that Noriega was a snitch for the CIA date back to the 50s when he was just a high school student at the National Institute. As Noriega was developing his relationship with U.S. intelligence, he was also building a reputation for violence. He is sent to work in Cologne. In Cologne, he rapes a prostitute. There is a scandal and an investigation. The regional commander intervenes and is going to relieve Noriega of his duties. But Torrios intercedes, and Noriega is not discharged. He is sent to Cherki. A few days after his arrival, he rapes a 13-year-old peasant girl. He beats up the girl and her little brother to the extent that they end up in the hospital. Another investigation is conducted, and again, Torrios intervenes and saves him. At the time, Panama was flourishing with the presence of Americans and their investments. The Panama Canal was shipping millions of tons of American goods through its locks, and the stability of the country was critical to U.S. interests. But the Americans were worried about communist-inspired revolution. This riot in Panama in 1964 left eight Panamanians dead. In the remote province of Chiriqui, the American-owned United Fruit Company felt threatened by a labor movement which it believed was communist-inspired. Noriega, now stationed in Chiriqui, had married a local girl. Promoted to lieutenant, he was in a good position to provide important information to protect United Fruit interests. The Americans found his information valuable, and he was officially put on the U.S. intelligence payroll. He was chosen for advanced training at the United States School of the Americas, but he did not do well. Out of 60 Panamanians enrolled, he finished 59th. 
In one course, according to his report card, he scored five out of a possible 100 points because he got lost in the jungle. He performed better when it came to espionage. According to his resume, Noriega took three intelligence courses from the Americans in 1967. He graduated from a counterintelligence course in the top third of his class. His performance was termed outstanding. In 1968, in a military coup, General Omar Torrijos became the first dictator in Panama's history. He spoke in favor of social reform and against the rich and powerful. He would become immensely popular, but within 14 months, a military coup was staged against him. Torrijos was out of the country in Mexico at the time, and the U.S. government did not want to see him lose power. Possibly at the urging of the CIA, Noriega allowed Torrijos to return to Panama through the province of Chiriquí, where he was now commander. The CIA told Noriega that Torrijos was returning anyway, and advised him to help Torrijos to return as a means of promoting himself. Noriega then opened up the province of Chiriquí to the plane in which Turrios was flying back. From that point, Duku crumbled. Noriega, whose ambition transcended his loyalty to Torrijos, had a hard time making up his mind on whether or not to permit Torrijos back into the country. As military commander of Chiriqui province, Noriega became a hero of the revolution for smoothing the way back for Torrijos and, in the process, accelerating his own rise to power. Although Torrijos was aware of Noriega's reputation for brutality, he rewarded him with the all-important post of head of military intelligence, known as G2. It was during this time, the early 1970s, that Mayan Correa was working as a journalist in Panama. She had become good friends with Torrijos, who was now firmly in place as Panama's leader. And what I think is that Torrijos did not have the guts to do some things that dictators need to do, which is repress, torture, kill, be tough. Noriega is the tough hand of the dictatorship. Torrijos is the nice human face, the nationalist. Noriega tried to censor Correa's news stories, and she complained to Torrijos. Every time Torrijos saw me, he said, don't talk like that about Noriega, he's going to kill you. That guy's mean. Don't talk about him. Listen to what I'm telling you. He always takes me apart and, and tell, don't say it. those things. He's going to get you, he's going to kill you. This son of a bitch is mean. Our goal is the unconditional surrender of the merchants of death who traffic in heroin. In the early 1970s, Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs, the first president to do so. Law and order issues were important to Nixon, and drug smuggling was to be a new and important battleground. Federal agents suspected Panama was a source of marijuana and a transshipment point for heroin, and they suspected Torrijos and Noriega were involved. At the CIA, John Bacon had been working on the Latin American desk for 20 years as an intelligence analyst. In a special arrangement, he was loaned to the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs in 1971. We used the working hypothesis that Noriega was probably dirty. That is, he was probably involved in uh, protecting the narcotics traffic either marijuana, heroin, cocaine, that anyone who wanted to be engaged in drug trafficking in Panama or through Panama as a transit point uh, had to come to terms with Noriega. Diplomatic relations were already strained over negotiations concerning the canal but the State Department was not pleased with certain efforts by the drug agents in Panama. Omar Torrijos's brother had been indicted for trafficking in heroin, 
and the Justice Department was about to arrest him. Under orders from the State Department, the ambassador to Panama at the time, Robert Sayre, warned Torrijos' brother of his imminent arrest, and he avoided capture. Agents were also after Noriega. In Miami in the fall of 1971, a drug smuggler was looking for a boat to go to Panama to pick up 400 pounds of marijuana, known as Panama Red. Federal drug agents learned of the trip, and two CIA contract agents were asked to provide the boat and go along undercover. In Panama, Noriega showed up in person for his payoff. The eyewitness accounts were corroborated when federal agents found Noriega's name and telephone number in the drug smuggler's address book. Was the information concerning Noriega considered hard evidence? Yes, it was hard evidence and it was uh, sufficient for indictment. The evidence consisted of an I, two eyewitnesses reporting that placing Noriega at the scene of uh, a drug transaction in which he received money for his protection for the movement of marijuana out of Panama. The former director of the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, John Ingersoll, declined to be interviewed on camera but he confirms that the information collected against Noriega at the time was hard evidence. But no indictment was forthcoming. Ingersoll says the Justice Department wouldn't indict someone they felt they couldn't bring to trial. Bacon says there was also a conflict with the CIA. Yes, there is a conflict, that there are priorities, that here is a, a man who's a, a, a drug dealer who is at the same time uh, being used to further U.S. interests in other fields. Presumably it was uh, the judge that, it, that he was of such value to the United States government that, he, that his other activities would have to be tolerated. The evidence against Noriega and others was considered so strong that Nixon ordered Director Ingersoll to fly to Panama and talk with Torrijos. Ingersoll pointed out to Torrijos that Panama was a key transit point for drugs because of its geographic location, the large volume of air and maritime traffic, and the involvement of some officials of government who accept bribes or become involved in the direction of the traffic. I know that uh, Noriega was aware of what was going on. I know that Noriega uh, was uh, very upset and piqued with uh, Ingersoll. But Torrijos paid little attention, and a frustrated White House ordered the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs to come up with a full list of options on how to get rid of Noriega. It included leaking information about Noriega's drug dealing to the press, leaking false information to Torrijos that Noriega was planning a coup against him. Of six options discussed, the last was the most extreme. Among these options was one to assassinate Noriega. It went that far? There was that it, much there was There was uh, consideration. It was, put, it was put on the table as a possible way, one possible way among others of dealing with Noriega, of solving the, the problem of Noriega as a um, threat and to the uh, we, we consider this a national security problem. Director Ingersoll immediately rejected the assassination option, and it was never implemented. But according to former federal investigators and a former CIA official, that decision further frustrated the White House, which then ordered one of their own people from the infamous plumber's unit to go to Mexico and await orders to assassinate Noriega. He was sent out of this country on, en route to Panama to assassinate, to await orders to assassinate Noriega. And he was called back. No one involved in the White House decision would comment on the assassination option. As federal agencies debated what to do, U.S. drug agents were thrown out of Panama 
and their office closed in 1972. They were eventually allowed back, but the State Department would now coordinate all their activities to avoid further diplomatic embarrassment. And Torrijos insisted that all drug investigations had to be coordinated with the head of military intelligence, Manuel Antonio Noriega. In 1974, Watergate forced Richard Nixon from office and pushed the war on drugs onto the back burner. Meanwhile, Noriega, as head of military intelligence, was increasing his contacts around the world. He met everyone from Moshi Dayan to Mother Teresa. The Panama Canal was important to the economic survival of many countries. They wanted to know Noriega almost as much as he wanted to know them. Although his record of association with U.S. military goes back over 15 years, Noriega maintains open channels with Cuban, Soviet, Chilean, and other political representatives. To the U.S., Noriega's dealings with Fidel Castro were the most troublesome. Castro found Noriega very useful, from circumventing a U.S. trade embargo to gathering intelligence to gun running. Manuel de Beunza worked for Castro as a member of Cuban intelligence for over 20 years. He defected well, two years uh, ago. Panama is very important to Castro. Uh, first, because uh, through Panama, he obtained all the material uh, the United States uh, has an embargo. For example, uh, uh, high technology, uh, computer, IBM, uh, software, um, different things uh, as very, uh, are, are in the, the, the embargo, no? And also... De Beyonce set up fake companies to run Castro's illicit businesses. He says Noriega kept 50% of the profits and that Noriega and Castro used one such company to smuggle drugs from Colombia to Miami via Havana. All the vessels from this company uh, make a rendezvous with the uh, Colombian boat and uh, the, uh, they, are, they, they pass all the, the drug from the Colombian vessel to the, the Happy Line vessel. And after that, they come in and carry on all the merchandise, the cocaine, to the Mariel military port in very close to Havana. And business between the two may also have included American secrets. Noriega bribed American soldiers stationed in Panama for sensitive information. He then allegedly passed that information on to the Cubans. Noriega uh, uh, have the power, Noriega have the army, Noriega have the control. And Noriega is a dirty man. Noriega liked it and loved it, all the dirty business. I don't view political experience as a detriment, Mr. Chairman. I view it as an asset. But I also recognize the need to leave politics behind the minute I take on this new job, if this Senate confirms me. In 1976, George Bush inherited Noriega as an intelligence asset when he was confirmed as director of the CIA. Congress was concerned about allegations that Noriega was selling information to the Cubans. Some complained that his services as an intelligence officer were for rent. And the question arose, just who was he working for? Nestor Sanchez worked for the CIA for 30 years in Latin American affairs. There, there, there are benefits to, to, uh, to having a man and being able to have relations with a man who has these different contacts. Now, uh, the argument can also be made that uh, who is he really working for? Or, well, he isn't working, I would say, the, the simple answer to that, uh, he's working for himself. He's not working for anybody else. And I think that, uh, that this is the only reasonable answer that can be given to that, uh, to that question. So it's a matter of balancing your interests, of balancing what you get and what you give, uh, which is the basis of, of any uh, liaison relationship. During his tenure, Bush kept Noriega on the payroll at over $100,000 a year. And the CIA eliminated narcotics reporting as a requirement on intelligence gathering on Panama.
Noriega was given a VIP tour of the CIA, and Bush and Noriega met to discuss a smooth transition to the new president, Jimmy Carter. But the Carter administration reached a different conclusion about Noriega. At first, his drawbacks simply outweighed his benefits to the U.S., and he was dropped from the payroll. But not for long. Ambler Moss went to Panama to be ambassador in 1978. And, uh, and of course, Noriega was designated to be the go-between between the Panamanian military and various U.S. agencies, such as the CIA, the DEA, the FBI. Uh, I wondered sometimes when Noriega had had a chance to get a lunch break, because he was working so many U.S. agencies at once, and this was completely on an official level. I mean, he was, he was the designated person to be the liaison for this. And at the same time, his G2, his intelligence people, were very, very useful to Torrijos um, in such operations as, for instance, finding out what was going on during the Sandinista Revolution in 1979. They, I'll, I'm, uh, I'll be free in admitting, often had much better intelligence about the unfolding of events in Nicaragua during the revolution than did U.S. intelligence sources. We are here to participate in the signing of treaties which will assure a peaceful and prosperous and secure future for an international waterway of great importance to us all. By the late 1970s, U.S.-Panamanian relations were at a peak. The Canal Treaty was finally being signed by Jimmy Carter and Omar Torrijos. Let's keep our eyes on the treaty. And in the, in the final judgment of this Senate, let's... But ratification the of the Canal Treaty by the, by the Senate would not be easy. Some conservative senators vehemently objected to giving up an asset as important as the Canal. If, in fact, the allegations are true, and there is some drug trafficking by Trios, can he be trusted as a guarantor of the treaties, and is he trustworthy and is he credible? The conservatives used allegations about drugs to try to win votes against the treaty. In October of 1977, Senator Robert Dole filed a specific request under the Freedom of Information Act for all DEA files relating to Panama. The DEA first claimed the files were irrelevant to the debate, said one of Dole's former staffers. Then they stonewalled us. Dole would never receive the complete files. I collected them. I went down to the file room. I put them in boxes. You gave them to him? I was told... I turned them, turned them over to uh, DEA's chief counsel. By now, John Bacon had joined the Drug Enforcement Administration full-time. He had been ordered to turn over all intelligence files on drug dealing in Panama, and he was specifically ordered not to make any copies. My speculation is what, this, what I believe is the most probable is that uh, since this was during the congressional debate on the canal zone uh, treaty, which was being uh, debated at that time, that uh, the Carter administration did not want information damaging to consideration of the treaty to be made available. Uh, we were told that, that a request had been received from members of Congress for derogatory information relating to uh, Noriega and other members of the Panamanian government. Congressional sources say the complete files never reached the senators debating the treaty. Bacon says they completely disappeared. Were the files returned to DEA? They were never returned. To this day, there's a, a great gap of information um, the information that originally could have uh, been used as a basis for indicting Noriega in 1971 is no longer available. It disappeared. The former DEA officials who gave Bacon the order say nothing is missing. One of them admitted that he took the classified files home, but that they were promptly returned and then given to the Senate Intelligence Committee, which reviewed the complete files. But in the committee's report, there is no indication that it had access to those files which would have included the hard evidence developed against Noriega in 1971. 
the committee cannot say on the basis of narcotics intelligence information alone that a given Panamanian official has or has not engaged in narcotics trafficking. Uh, no one involved in the collection, no one who was aware of it could, uh, uh, could react in any way other than to be appalled or astounded. This was a terrible thing that uh, make this huge gap. Uh, a number of, of uh, drug investigations simply had to be stopped because the, the, uh, the files were not there. And investigations into Noriega stopped? We could not carry on any investigations relating to Panama because all of, none of the files were available. Just a year later, another investigation into Noriega would be thwarted. In 1979, as the Sandinistas were fighting to overthrow the Somoza government in Nicaragua, some of the guns used in the rebellion were traced here to Miami. Evidence was gathered which showed that the weapons were being purchased by Noriega. But Jerry Sanford, an assistant U.S. attorney, was having a hard time with the State Department about the investigation. The State Department seemed to leave its footprint pretty close to, uh, to the law enforcement activities, uh, if not stepping on our toes. Sanford says he was close to indicting Noriega when an individual who worked for the CIA told him that Noriega was not really worried about the investigation. Uh, Noriega is not concerned about it. He's not worried about it. He's got enough cards to play with the United States government that he isn't worried. Meaning, and he expanded on that to some, to some extent by just saying that he has done enough favors for the United States agencies that he knows the United States knows him, owes him favors. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami sent a prosecution memo to the Justice Department, where it sat for several months. Justice came back and said, gee, we lost your pros memo. Uh, can you send us another one? So another one went up, and a few more months passed, and eventually... Uh, as I recall somebody's words, whether it was somebody from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami or at the Justice Department, the case just got too cold and nothing really ever happened. The Carter administration would not indict Noriega. The reason, Sanford was told, was that Noriega was too important to the national interest. Panama had recently given sanctuary to the deposed Shah of Iran. Noriega was in charge of his security, and any further investigation would be embarrassing. It gets to be very frustrating because you feel that you are performing your oath of office, that you're going to obey the laws of the Constitution of the United States of America, and all the laws of the United States of America. And then when you do try to do it, you find yourself thwarted at times by the foreign policy considerations that seem to take uh, precedence over the law enforcement. In 1981, Omar Torrijos died suddenly in a mysterious plane crash. In the ensuing power struggle, Noriega carefully manipulated his way past three other commanders to take full control of the military. By 1983, the illegitimate son of his father's maid, rejected at birth, had become the de facto leader of Panama. Jose Blandón was a close associate of Noriega's. Noriega is a man of very humble origins. He is a man who knows poverty because he experienced it. And this knowledge of poverty makes him rejected. That's why you see him later in life as a man who is tied down to luxury. He enjoys it in excess, in my opinion, as a means to compensate for what he lacked in his childhood. But he is also faced with another problem. Noriega is a very ugly man, and he lives with that complex. In Latin America, the concept of machismo goes very deep, especially in the military. 
Because for a military man to have many women is synonymous with strength and capability. So because Noriega is ugly, he had problems conquering women because he was rejected. But he is also a man who knows how to study people's weaknesses. A great part of Noriega's advancement is due to the fact that he works on people's weaknesses. I know him personally. I think he's a person uh, without any ideology at all. I've never seen any evidence that he has an ideology of the left or the right, anything like that. It's very pragmatic. Um, and I would say that even though he has been in this uh, position of power since August of 1983, and uh, in the position of, of defying Washington and successfully all through 1988 and into 1989, that I would say uh, that he's not a person who has sort of a messianic sense of his own destiny the way Latin American dictators often have. If you think of a Castro or you think of a Pinochet, if you think of a Perón, these people clearly had some idea of how they were out to either save the world or save their country or, or be something in the world. And uh, Noriega doesn't have that kind of philosophy, I don't think. He understands power, he understands money, uh, he understands survival in a very pragmatic way, but I don't look, him, look, at, look at him as a typical Latin American caudillo type in the, in the old school. In a candid moment, Noriega spoke to a reporter from Colombian television. What's General Noriega like? What's he like? Just like you see me, peaceful? Not complicated. I enjoy simple things. Complicated things tangle me up. I am a military engineer, and I used to get headaches every time we used logarithms or studied astronomy. Complicated things are against my nature. I like jokes, drinking, good fun. And work. You're telling me about those things you like. Uh, tell me about what you don't like. I don't like people to screw with me. I truly believe the history of this century forces me to believe that to do nothing in Central America is to give the first communist stronghold on the North American continent a green light to spread its poison throughout this free and increasingly democratic hemisphere. The Reagan administration redefined the national interest as combating communism, and Noriega made sure to ingratiate himself with the new president by doing whatever he could to help. In 1983, when the U.S. invaded Grenada, Vice President George Bush reportedly asked Noriega to call Fidel Castro and warn him that it would be against Cuba's interest to become directly involved. Bush denies he made the request. Castro described the call from Noriega in an interview on Panamanian television. On the day of the invasion during the dawn hours, when the combat was going to take place and our personnel was surrounded by Yankee troops, General Noriega made an effort to reach a ceasefire. Two months later, Bush and Noriega met in Panama. A source who was present says they discussed the Contra War. Bush denies it. But Noriega would do whatever he could to help the U.S. and its war against Nicaragua. He gave weapons and money to Contra leaders. And according to Elio Camarena, a former lawyer for the Panamanian Defense Forces, at the request of the U.S., Noriega allowed the Contras to train in Panama. Sí. At Quarry Height headquarters of the American military in Panama, General John Galvin met with Noriega and, in my presence, stated the need the Southern Command had for a remote area outside of the U.S. bases for the training of the Nicaraguan Contras. According to information from the trial of Oliver North, 
Noriega also helped blow up an arsenal of weapons in Managua in 1985. And according to sworn congressional testimony, one of Noriega's partners, the elusive Mike Harari, a former secret agent of the Israeli intelligence service, set up an arms distribution network which included the Contras. Ese es el dirigente que asume el país, la dirección en 1983. In 1983, Noriega is the leader who assumes the power to lead the country, coinciding with the political phenomenon which I have called the period of complete amorality. No one developed any concept of morals. Noriega, a man who lived in his own obscure world, engages at a time when the United States operate in Central America without morals. Their policy being, no matter what must be done, we must back the Contras. And if you back the Contras, no matter what you did, you are an ally of the United States. While Noriega was helping the United States to fight communism, he was pursuing his own interest in money by allegedly striking deals with the Medellin drug cartel in Colombia. Y claro, yo lo que... Roberto Diaz Herrera was Noriega's second in command. By that time, although the officers didn't dare talk too much, because Noriega was already Noriega, there was a strong sense of cocaine in the air, near headquarters. In addition to his alleged drug dealing with Fidel Castro, two of Noriega's former associates say that Noriega allowed the cartel to build a cocaine lab in Panama in return for a payoff of several million dollars. And in 1984, when the Minister of Justice in Colombia, Laura Bonilla, was assassinated, several members of the cartel fled to Panama. Noriega gave them sanctuary. Augusto Villalas was a major in Noriega's Air Force. I saw in Panama two of the drug lords. I saw Gacha and Escobar, because they were both horse fans. They lived in Panama for a while after Lara Bonilla died. They were in hiding, but they would go see the horses, and uh, I would see them there because I am also a fan of that sport. Roberto Eisenman is the publisher of the opposition newspaper in Panama. It is the first time in which the narco mafias have actually controlled the formal military institution of a country and through that control, control the country, and then put the country at the service of the multinational criminal enterprise. Every country in the continent has a drug problem. Every country in the world has a drug problem. No other country in the world has this kind of problem, where the formal military institution, the uniformed authority, is actually controlled by the multinational narco mafias. But at the same time, Noriega was cooperating with the DEA in Washington, giving them information about drug traffickers. I'm sending drugs to the United States. Richard Gregory was an assistant U.S. attorney in Miami. Uh, he's got to he saw Noriega's cooperation as a ploy to divert suspicion and, uh, from himself. Unfortunately, Panama was a place where when General Noriega didn't get his rent money for the month, he'd uh, give you up to the Drug Enforcement Administration. In fact, when I first came here, we used to have what we called Panamanian extraditions. And it was one of the few countries in the, uh, in the hemisphere where if they caught a drug dealer, they would put him on a plane to the U.S. and just ship him out. Despite the evidence of Noriega's own drug dealing, over a 10-year period, he would receive congratulatory letters from the U.S. government. Thank you very much for the autographed photograph. I have had it framed, and it is proudly displayed in my office. Your long-standing support of the Drug Enforcement Administration is greatly appreciated. Best regards, Bud Mullen, Director, DEA. The DEA says that at the time, it had no hard evidence of Noriega's drug dealing. 
But by 1985, evidence of drug dealing was being put forth publicly by Ugo Spatafora, a longtime Noriega critic. Spatafora passed his information on to reporter Sanchez Bourbon at the opposition newspaper. Mientras tanto, él, como algunas otras personas, comienza... He, like others, starts to have serious worries about Noriega. Since he had befriended Noriega's pilots, he starts learning about the magnitude of Noriega's involvement in the drug traffic. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy School of Government. We are pleased to have as our guest tonight General Manuel Antonio Noriega Moreno, the Commander-in-Chief of the... In 1985, Noriega was still enjoying his role on the international stage. In February, he was in the United States at Harvard University. And in September, he was in France. While there, Noriega would allegedly order his forces to make an example out of Spatafora. What would happen to him was a warning to anyone else who would criticize Noriega. A decapitated corpse, presumed to be that of Dr. Hugo Spadafora, a former vice minister of health under Panamanian strongman Omar Torrios, but an avowed enemy of the present Panamanian military commander, General Noriega, was found on September 14, 1985, in Costa Rica, near the Panamanian border. Attorney Steve Schmabley investigated for the Spadafora family. There are eyewitnesses who, I can, who can trace his uh, path from Costa Rica into Panama. He's last seen alive being detained by a PDF member. Uh, the next morning, his tortured and, and decapitated body is found uh, in an area where PDF jeeps have been uh, uh, seen driving around. Another crucial bit of evidence that we presented was that there had been numerous death threats directly and indirectly conveyed to Spadafora from uh, the PDF and from Noriega. Schmabley argued the case before the Human Rights Commission of the Organization of American States. The OAS investigation found the government of Panama guilty, but it could not try individuals, and no one was ever charged. In Washington, Noriega was now becoming an embarrassment despite his usefulness as an intelligence asset. As the years went by, Elliot Abrams was Under Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs during the Reagan administration. It became clearer and clearer that there was drug trafficking through Panama and that uh, Noriega was involved in it. Already in 1985, because of repression and uh, corruption, drug trafficking, we had begun to make it clear to Noriega that we did not like the way he was behaving, and his behavior got worse and worse. We began to distance ourselves more and more. Um, so it wasn't something that started um, on one given day or culminated one day. It was a process of, of uh, distancing ourselves from Noriega. In an effort to bolster his image in Washington, Noriega hired a public relations firm, International Business Communications, which had close ties with the Reagan administration. The administration's messages to Noriega were confused and contradictory. John Poindexter of the National Security Council flew to Panama allegedly to warn Noriega to cut out his drug dealing, while Oliver North met Noriega in London, where they discussed assassination and sabotage against the Sandinista leaders. And CIA Director William Casey met Noriega on several occasions, but reportedly only discussed intelligence matters and never confronted Noriega about his drug dealing. In the midst of Washington's confusion, Richard Gregory was collecting evidence in Miami to indict Noriega for drug trafficking. Uh, the more we dug into sensitive international areas, especially dealing with South and Central America, the more I found out that uh, the, the United States priority is not the narcotics traffickers, but rather it's the, uh, uh, the clandestine uh, affairs of our intelligence and foreign relations community. In October of 1987, Gregory went to Washington to discuss the result of his independent investigation. I went to Washington to lay out to both the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Justice Department 
what it is that I had and where we were going with it. Um, I met with mixed reactions. Some people thought this was just magnificent, that somebody finally was going to have first-hand evidence on Noriega. There were other people who uh, thought it was the worst thing that could possibly be done. They told me to, to, uh, that I was crazy, to, that I'd never make the case, to leave it alone. I don't think that there's anyone else in the, in the United States. Of course, States at this time, in the middle of the Iran-Contra scandal, sure there weren't too many people, especially with the presidential election coming up in a year, who were going to say, no, you can't uh, indict a case on a, a Central American general who's been uh, bringing in narcotics to this country and, and who has been double-dealing the United States. Um, I don't know what the political reasoning was, but I do know that um, uh, after the indictment was approved in Washington, Leon Kellner, who was the U.S. attorney, went to a meeting at the, uh, at the White House. And when I say the White House, I don't mean with the president, but with leaders of the National Security Council. And um, uh, one of the reactions was to uh, Leon Kellner, since when did some assistant United States attorney uh, get the authority to, to make foreign policy? Uh, I don't think Leon uh, chose to argue with them at that point, but my reaction to that statement is uh, we got involved with, with indicting people in foreign policy when the people who were making foreign policy uh, began dealing with dope dealers. These photographs from Noriega's personal collection tell much of the story of his last years in power. He went to France where he was honored and vacationed with his family. Meanwhile, President Reagan was applying economic sanctions against Panama and talking tough about getting rid of the dictator. Noriega apparently took the American pressure seriously. Here he inspects a new arms shipment from Cuba AK-47s and rocket-propelled grenades. When Panamanian officers attempted a coup in 1988, there was no U.S. support. It failed. Noriega had the officers photographed and sent them off to prison where they were tortured. Before President Reagan left office, his administration would try unsuccessfully to negotiate Noriega out of power, and it would consider then reject military action against Panama, including an invasion by U.S. troops. Noriega had successfully defied the United States. I thought we would do something. I was actually not just angered and disappointed, but surprised that the product of the interagency process, that the ultimate American action was basically nothing. Canada. Do you fear at some point someone will attempt against your life? I know that an attempt against my life is a possibility, but I have no fear because I am a son of God. I am a Christian. If Christ is with me, then who can be against me? In May of 1989, Noriega overturned the results of the elections in Panama and ordered the beating of opposition candidates. President Bush responded by openly encouraging the Panamanian Defense Forces to overthrow Noriega. But in October, when officers staged yet another coup attempt, the Bush administration provided only limited help. The coup failed. President Bush's decision to invade Panama in December finally ended two years of confusion and indecision in Washington. As president, I have no higher obligation than to safeguard the lives of American citizens. And that is why I directed our armed forces to protect the lives of American citizens in Panama and to bring General Noriega to justice in the United States. President Bush had finally decided that the national interest required the U.S. to remove Noriega. But for nearly 30 years, as Noriega's power grew and evidence of his corruption and brutality mounted, the U.S. government had consistently concluded that the national interest was served by leaving Noriega in place and ignoring or hiding evidence of his criminal behavior. One former CIA official put it this way, 
over the course of the seven administrations that dealt with Noriega, the national interest was simply a matter of political convenience. Noriega has always denied publicly any charges that he was involved in drug trafficking, and he has not yet entered a plea to the federal indictment against him. Noriega's attorneys continue to insist that the U.S. government seized Noriega illegally and therefore has no right to try him. Because of the difficult legal issues in the case, many observers are speculating it may be a year before Noriega actually comes to trial. Thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Woodruff. Good night. People are so used to seeing Soviet women as tractor drivers or farm workers or milkmaids. Or is the status and struggles of